And I know many things where I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Crime is peculiar in that it sometimes occurs among the ranks of people who have never transgressed before. Ordinary workday people. People like Arthur Winslow, respectable, solid, exactly like a hundred other respectable, solid, big city commuters. Arthur's life was a pretty drab affair, including the dull days at J.C. Wells and Company, investment broker. Universal Automatic, seven and an eighth, no change. Seven and an eighth, no change. Latest reported earnings per common share, 69 cents. Latest earnings? 69 cents. Paid last year, 20 cents with extras. 20 cents with extras. Better leave it there, Arthur. Five o'clock. You gotta make that 5.19. Why? Why do we have to catch the 519, Stanley? Why? Why, because we always do. Do you think that's a good enough reason? I mean, do you think just because we've always caught the 519, we ought to go on catching the 519 for the rest of our lives? Is something wrong, Arthur? Maybe. I don't know. I've been thinking, Stanley. For 10 years now, you and I have been analyzing investment securities eight hours a day. We've been catching the 519 every night. We've been arriving home at East Orange promptly at 622. We've been kissing our wives at approximately 650. We eat our dinner at exactly seven. We read the evening paper. We go to bed. It's a little like death, isn't it, Stanley? What in the world's got into you, Arthur? Take a look at this. This book got me thinking. The moon and sixpence. It's all about a man like us. A man who got fed up with a 519 and ditched the whole works. What'd he do? Took a chance. Walked out. Picked up his hat. Went off to the South Seas. He just picked up and left his family? <laughs> they preferred the 519. Well, I can't say I approve. Yeah, I didn't think you would. Well, you better hurry. You'll miss your train. My train? <laughs> I give it to you as a token of 10 years of faithful service. Just for a change, Arthur, after 10 years, you'll walk down Broad Street slowly. Notice the hurrying commuters objective. Your stroll eventually brings you to Max, doesn't it? A place you've heard about. Often wondered exactly what's inside. You've never had time to find out until now. Have you, Arthur? Mr. Winslow. Oh, hello. Uh, Benny, remember? I run the elevator, the Majestic Building. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, you, uh, must you try your luck, huh? I beg your pardon. The back room. I just knocked over Gus myself. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you're not so interested in the bang tails, or you'd know Gus. Bang tails? You mean horses? I don't mean rabbits. 
<laughs> this Gus, he's a bookie? You mean you've never seen any spread back there? No. Well, uh, is it time? Yeah, sure. Well, come on. I'll show you. No, man, in business, I like want to know about these places. Don't be Harry, friend of mine. Well, here she is, pal. Here's the board. Now, over here is where they take your money. Sometimes they even give it back to you. And that's the work. That's uh, the morning light on all the tracks in the country. And that little column on the right, the odds on all the horses. Pink Lady, Mike the Second, Big Bonanza, Moon. I don't believe it. Hmm? How do you like that? Moon and Sixpence. You mean you know something? Well, the name, that's all. It's the title of a book. Oh, it's more than that. It's a real horse. I've been watching him. I've been thinking about playing him in a three horse parlay. You know what a parlay is? <laughs> Look. You pick three horses, you see. You put your dough on, say, um, Blue Bonnet in the first. If he comes in, the dough goes on Glow Worm in the second. And if he comes in... I see. Then all the money goes on Moon and Sixpence in the third. <laughs> I, I get it. Yeah, it's a plenty long shot, of course. But there's a big payoff for the gent who's willing to take a chance. And believe me, you never get nowhere as if you don't take a chance once in a while. Right, Mr. Winslow? Right. You know, I think I'll... I think I'll take $50 worth. 50? Wow! <laughs> well, look, uh, I'm not the bookie. He's over there. Wait a minute. You give me the dough. I'll lay it on for you. 50 bucks on the parlay, huh? That's right. Lay it on for me, pal. 50 bucks on Blue Bonnet, Glow Worm, Moon and Sixpence. You've got it. It's your big chance, Mr. Winslow. beginning, wasn't it, Arthur? Though at the moment of arriving home, you're unaware of just how much you changed your life. It was a bold stroke, wasn't it? Missing your train, betting on the races, throwing caution, reason, and routine aside. Yes, and there's more to follow. Though right now, it only seems like you are just 26 minutes off the normal schedule of your life. I've been worried sick. Well, Stanley I... came home as usual. I saw him across the street. Where have you been? Oh, well, I was tied up. What do you mean, tied up? You've never been late to dinner in your life before. Where were you? Clean enough. Come in and eat your dinner. Chops are all dried up. Well? Well, I'm coming. I don't know why you couldn't have telephoned. You knew it was Monday night. The night Mr. Dalrymple inspects me at the welfare center. I still have to be there at seven sharp. It just means rush, rush, rush. I never stop. Oh, I forgot. Did you get your check? Arthur. Arthur. Yes? It's payday, your paycheck. Did you get it? Oh, yes, my paycheck. Yes, I got it. I cashed it at noon. I... Well, what's the matter? Uh, nothing. 20, 25, 35, 55, 65, 70. Why, you're $50 short. Yes. Employees Association. Annual insurance. Something new? Yes, that's right, Ethel. Something new. Oh, $50. I don't know how in the world they expect you to exist on the salary you make. Well, I haven't even time for dessert now. If you had enough gumption, you'd do as I tell you and ask for a raise. I don't know why you don't go to Mr. Hollis. I can tell him it's right time to get you one. You forget.
dug out all about Mr. Dalrymple, didn't you, Art? Yes. And the welfare center where Ethel hasn't missed a Monday evening in three years. And you're back at the office. Back with your dreams of moon and sixpence. The South Sea. Escape. Winslow. Boy, you're in the chips. What is it, Benny? What are you talking about? You mean you haven't heard? No. What is it? The parlay. It came in. Blue bonnet, glow worm, moon and sixpence. Oh, brother, you got yourself about 5,700 bucks. <laughs> That's right. Go get your money right over here. Come on. Hey, what are you going to do with it? I don't know. Wait a minute. Yes, I do. I know exactly what I'm going to do with it. Crime. Sometimes it really is a matter of degree. Certainly at this particular point, Arthur Winslow didn't feel like a criminal. It's simply a matter of no more routine. No more listening to Ethel's reports on the meeting run by Mr. Dalrymple. No more 519. No, Arthur. Today, it's the 922 luxury flight to Florida. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Oh, the moon and sixpence. Wonderful, isn't it? I'm, um, I'm on my second reading. You believe it? You think it's right? You mean, uh, tossing everything over? Taking off from a, from the South Seas? He could have stuck it out. Licked it if it took the rest of his life, is that it? All right, so he licks it. He's found happiness at last. In his 70s. Somehow, I think running away is better than that. Don't you? I did once. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to. That's all right. You see, I did run away. It was just like you said, routine. Deadly routine. I just couldn't stand it any longer. What kind of routine? Well, uh, perhaps you've heard of my father, Edgar Brewster. The Edgar Brewster? What kind of routine is that? Keeping up with my father, or any of his Wall Street pals, for that matter. Uh, not easy. Too easy. Easy and useless and dull. I didn't mean to get so serious. Anyway, my father's in Miami waiting for me now. I finally decided to go back to my mink line cell. I'm taking the sixpence and forgetting about the moon. I'm sorry. Well, that helps helps a lot. You see, I uh, haven't had much moral support. By the way, are you going to Miami Beach, too? Yes, yes, I am. Incidentally, my first name's Vivian. Uh, I'm Charles White. Nice to know you, Charles White. Hope I see you again in Miami. So do I. I'll be at the Sea Terrace Hotel. Wall Street, isn't it, Art? 
and his daughter actually said she hoped you'd meet again in Miami. You wait for the call the next day and the next. Finally, Art. Finally, it comes. You actually can't believe it. That you're being invited to the Brewster home. Exactly what are you doing in Miami, White? Why, I, I just got a little tired of New York. <laughs> you got the right idea. Did the same thing myself 20 years ago. Never went back. Hmm. What's your line? Well, I, I was uh, in the market, more or less. Uh, the less the better these days. Nobody knows where it's going. My broker and I were talking today about consolidated plastics. You know anything about it? Uh, yes, a little. Well, what do you think of it? Well, of course, that's your business, Mr. Brewster. I wouldn't want to offer an opinion. Please, Dad. I mean, never mind, dear. I want to hear what he has to say. Uh, White, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, what would you do if you were in it rather heavily right now? Well, frankly, I'd sell. Any particular reason? Only because I happen to know it's a bad investment. I, I can't tell you why. Hmm. Well, that's unbelievable. My broker told me... No, it's all right. Mr. Brewster, uh, it's only my opinion, but I happen to know the financial condition of that company. Now, you uh, asked me what I would do, and I've told you. You see, uh, investments are uh, it's sort of a hobby with me, you see. Yes, Art. And that night was only the beginning, was it? The next three weeks passed like a dream. Like the night at her home, dancing in the open under the stars, with Vivian in your arms. and the others that followed. You know that you're in love, don't you, Art? Actually, for the first time in your life, you know what love really is. Well, hello, Mr. Brewster. Hello, Charles. Say, I just wanted you to see this. Just look at it. Consolidated plastic snowed under and in selling rush. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Brewster. I'm not. I took your advice. Sold out three weeks ago. Saved myself $100,000. Well, congratulations. Oh, don't congratulate me. You're the one who deserved it. Mind if I sit down? Oh, no, no, sir, not at all. Well, sit down, Charles, sit down. I want to have a little talk with you. Would you be open to uh, a proposition? Oh, I realize you probably have other rank like that's worth your while, I think. Uh, there are two considerations. Yes. The first is the plain fact that my affairs are getting a little beyond me. You know, I, I'm retired. Uh, I don't give them the proper attention. Frankly, I think you're the man to take over. Take over? Oh, but Mr. Brewster, I... Now, wait till I've finished. I've been watching you pretty closely during the past month. I can tell that you know investment and that you're sure of yourself. White, I'm a businessman. If this weren't a profitable deal for me, I wouldn't think of it. I see. What's the other consideration? Well, I believe you're aware of that already. Vivian? Oh, you disapprove? My boy, on the contrary, I approve heartily. I suppose I can think this over. Uh, I mean, the business proposition. Why, of course, my boy, of course. Just let me know in a day or two, will you? Didn't want to rush you. Take your time. Just wanted to give you a little something to think about. And there it is, Art. Brief and to the point. Everything you've ever wanted. Right in the palm of your hand. Open sesame. 
You leave your room with the idea of taking a walk to think. Wasn't it, Arthur? A beautiful dream. And now the sudden awakening with the arrival of your wife, Ethel. You wonder how she found you, don't you, Arthur? What she's going to do. By nightfall, Ethel still hasn't come near you, has she? And you still haven't been able to call Vivian. There's something else on your mind. Something you never dreamed you'd think of. The one way out. And then suddenly you know you must be fair with Vivian. Cypress 7834. Vivian? Now please, you listen to me. I want to see you. There's something I... Never mind that, just listen. I... I'm a phony. My name isn't White. I was running away when we met on the plane. I... I love you. But Vivian, I have a wife. In East Orange. I said I love you. Nothing you or anybody says makes any difference. But it does make a difference, Vivian. As long as she's alive, she'll... Please, you don't understand. I... which you ran away. You can't do this, can you? Even with a wife that you've hated for years and now have at your mercy, you simply can't do it. Arthur! <laughs> so you thought you could get by with it, didn't you? Don't try to deny it. I know what's been going on and I can prove it. You. You philander. I had a complete report of your activities for the past month. You weren't very clever, Arthur. The detectives say you left a trail a child could follow. Arthur! That's probably Vivian Brewster. I talked to her this afternoon. She may as well come in. Arthur, I was frightened. It's all right. Come in. <laughs> A pretty picture. For your information, Arthur, I'm leaving for Reno in the morning. In view of what's happened, I don't think you'll feel it wise to contest the case. Contest it? We've been waiting for a chance like this for five years. Mr. Dalrymple and I. Dalrymple? Oh, no. Ethel told me so much about him, he sounds like a wonderful man. I don't know how she put up with you all these years. I couldn't have if it hadn't been for Mr. Dalrymple. He's so understanding. Oh, Arthur, why are you always so ridiculous? What were you doing holding that silly ram's head in your hand? 